This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, a hub for homebrewers since 1978. Visit homebrewersassociation.org for award-winning recipes, brewing tips, and community. Homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 16th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Scott Jenish of Sapwood Cellars and author of The New IPA, a scientific guide to hop aroma and flavor, talks about dry hopping strategies for hazy pale ales. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, and we appreciate those who have, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. And uh, thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. There's more stuff coming your way if you are a Patreon supporter. Steve and I are finally going to get together in the next day or so to record video and audio stuff. 2020 has been tricky so far for getting together to record. Um, Looking forward to it, though. It's always good to see Steve, and it's always fun to taste good beer and talk about it uh, with somebody who enjoys the same thing that you do. Uh, we got some tasty stuff to sample and talk about Uh, If you'll remember from last week, listener Josh asked for uh, money-saving strategies, especially for brewing small batch beers, and we've got some feedback for Josh. Seth writes in and says, I think you were spot on with regards to reusing yeast. Yeast is my biggest expense in any given batch, but I've got a library of about five strains in my fridge that I reuse time and time again. Seth says, uh, additionally, I would say one of the things that has saved me the most money is to improve and increase my brew house efficiency. The more efficient my process is, the less I have to spend on ingredients. Brew in a bag is simple, efficient, and effective for optimizing my spend and time when homebrewing. I appreciate that, uh, Seth. Um, if you're if you're just making one gallon batches, uh, you can also skip the bag altogether and use a, a colander or a sieve to uh, strain the grains out of your wort. Uh, and uh, you 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 will have to use a second pot to go from your so-called mash tun uh, into your kettle. But uh, I've done that very successfully. A uh, friend of the show, Scott Kaway, wrote in. Scott says if fermenters are an issue. You can cover your boil kettle after chilling and pitching with cling film and a big rubber band and ferment in the pot you boiled in. Scott says works really well, but you do have to aerate somehow. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Yeah, that that may be a way to step up the size of batches for Josh without uh, having to invest in fermenters right away. Uh, Everybody has a different approach to brewing, which is one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much. Casey from our sponsor, Imperial Organic Yeast, has some good news. Casey says there is a new seasonal strain available until the end of February. It's called L09 Que Bueno. Que Bueno creates refreshing light to dark lagers with very clean, low ester aromatic profiles and nice, crisp, and dry finishes. Uh, Casey says this strain is not just a great choice for Mexican lagers, but any lager where clean ester profile and dry finish is appropriate. She says, K Bueno is excellent for brewing Mexican lagers, Vienna lagers, my box, and more. And, you know, we're in lagering season up here in the Northern Hemisphere, you know. Uh, we love Imperial Organic Yeast. My stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore for five-gallon batches of moderate gravity beers. Imperial has the highest pitch rate, 200 billion cells. And Imperial Yeast has a recommended shelf life now of four months I can't wait to try L09 Que Bueno. Uh, Look for it at your local homebrew shop. Uh, I've got a couple of packets set aside for myself, and I'm going to do some research on lagers uh, from south of the border to get some inspiration. Uh, Looking forward to using L09 Que Bueno from Imperial Organic Yeast. 
Let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Tim writes in with something on topic when thinking about Me- Mexican-inspired beers. Tim says, uh, this is a bit too low-key for a disaster show, but I thought you would get a kick out of it. Just a few minutes ago, I was cutting peppers for a jalapeno cream ale my buddy and I have been working on. And Tim says, thanks for the old cream ale show, by the way. It helped a ton in building the recipe. <laughs> Tim says, when I finished up with the peppers, I threw them in the freezer for later use, checked on my son, who is a year and a half old, to make sure he hadn't found some trouble in the three minutes it took to prepare the peppers, and realized I needed to go to the bathroom. Tim says, no, no, what didn't I mention there? Oh, that's right, washing my hands after handling the peppers. Needless to say, I'm typing this while pretending nothing is wrong for the kid and waiting for the burn to go away. (laughs) What a nice reminder to always wash your hands after handling peppers, even ones you don't consider all that spicy. (laughs) Yes, Tim. Yes. Uh, That's a lesson well learned. I, I had a similar experience with Carolina Reapers. Even after I washed my hands in what I thought was a, a thorough way. So, yeah, be careful. Get some gloves. Uh (laughs) <laughs> Keep the heat down. <laughs> hey, our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa, are running a special in January just for Basic Brewing Radio listeners. So listen up. 20% off beer and wine kits all this month at highgravitybrew.com. Just use the code BB20N20JAN on highgravitybrew.com when you shop for beer and wine kits, and you'll save 20%. That's a great deal. I don't have to tell you. Some of the featured beer kits on HighGravityBrew.com this month are Catherine the Second, Imp- Russian Imperial Stout, Boggy Bottom Barley Wine, and Northern Lights Winter Ale. Uh, now all those are high gravity beers, so you know twenty percent off of those can save you a bunch. Uh, and if you make wine kits, you know that making your own wine is uh, easy, especially compared to beer. And you and it's less expensive than buying commercial wines, and you get some good stuff. I was trying some uh, a, a a wine that I made from a kit last night, and compared that to a commercial version, the a Pinot Noir, and I liked mine better. Uh, with this special, you know, making beer and wine at home with these kits is even is 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 twenty percent less expensive. You just have to have to remember the code. So get a pen out. It's it's kind of a long one. BB20N20JAN. That's BB20IN20JAN. BB20N20JAN. Highgravitybrew.com is the place for electric brewing solutions and tons of great beer and wine kits, along with everything else you need. BB20N20JAN is the code you need at family owned and operated highgravitybrew.com during January for 20% off. Beer and wine kits. Highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's talk to Scott Janish about dry hopping delicious hazy pale ales. Scott Janish, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me back again. This is our third conversation, I believe, uh, based on chapters of your book, uh, The New IPA, A Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. Uh, and uh, if you if you're brewing the new IPAs, you need to get this book, right? <laughs> I think so. I'm a little <laughs> biased, but yeah. <laughs> now this isn't. I'm intimidated uh, because <laughs> this chapter on or the chapters on dry hopping. There's a ton of information in there, and you and I both went out on Facebook and asked people for questions. So we got lots of questions. We got lots of notes. You sent me some notes, and I got my own notes. <laughs> so I'm I'm afraid that you know we're not going to hit everything. But the good thing is that that everything is in the book. So you need to get the book. Uh, if you if we miss something, they just need to read. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it is just a lot of a lot of information. It's sometimes it's kind of hard to grasp. I actually listened to uh, the dry hopping chapter. Um, book on tape today at the gym, which is not very motivational when you're running on the treadmill to hear about humulones and alpha acids, but <laughs> it's <a> good, <laughs> I got to remember everything here. <laughs> well, if, if the, if, if the, uh, if the audio book guy was able to pronounce, is it hu- humulonones? 
Yeah, that's why I didn't do it myself. I I can't do all that. <laughs> yeah, humulones. Hum, humulones. <laughs> Again, get the book. It's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now, the first thing, the very first thing uh, in everything, it seems like oxygen is is the big is the big enemy uh and uh, let's see if i can find the ones uh, uh that uh that the questions that that mentioned uh uh ah here we go uh, dimitri on facebook uh, recommendations or techniques to avoid oxidation during dry hopping on the homebrew level especially when you dry hop, hop cold for example at 10c as you recommended in your recent article i guess you wrote an article on your blog Mm, yep. Yep. Recently trying to make a case for cooler and shorter um, dry hop durations, which I'm, I'm sure we'll hit on quite a bit. Um, yeah, th those things are on my list, those factors. But <laughs> <laughs> but first of uh, all, why why should we avoid ox uh, oxidation or exposure to oxygen at the stage where we're dry hopping? Well, I mean, I think most brewers understand that oxygen um, in any style is, you, you know, going to negatively impact beer but especially in hazy ipas which are just um, so sensitive to um, oxygen and they can go downhill pretty quickly i mean you can you can see visually see a hazy ipa go from you know a nice straw hazy color to um, a darker version of itself in a matter of days if it has um, little oxygen at packaging um, so and if you're going to be dry hopping um, particularly after um primary fermentation is over. Um, this is when um, trying to avoid any oxygen uptake is, is the most important because if you're, um, say you're adding dry hops at day three or four and there's still a little bit of fermentation going on um, and you open up that fermenter and drop in the hops, hopefully that active fermentation will kind of scrub whatever oxygen um, gets introduced from just that short little time it takes to drop in the hops. But if you're doing it on day seven or eight, um, fermentation's done, the yeast is pretty much settled out, um, and you open up that fermenter, and that's um, oxygen is you know in direct contact with with the beer. Um, and this might even be more important um, for home brewers because, I mean, if you open up, like for example, uh, at uh, Sapwood we have um, like four inch ports on our on our ten barrel tanks, um, and so that's um, four four inches when we open up the drop in hops um, in contact with you know, 300 plus gallons of beer where um, if you have a bucket at home and you have five gallons of beer and you open up the cover to that bucket that oxygen is getting introduced to just five gallons um, versus you know a smaller opening for us on 300 um, gallons so um, the professional level you're getting a little more dilution of oxygen with beer um, so this is especially important for um, smaller homebrew batches to try to avoid oxygen pickup. Um, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, I've experimented with just uh, purging the headspace um, while you open up the the fermenter. Um, so if you have, I mean, you could even just you know take a, a hose and hook it to your um, CO2 tank and essentially just run like 10, 15 psi in that headspace um, while you drop in the the hops real quick. That I mean, it's not a perfect solution, but it's it's at least something. Um, another great way to avoid oxygen when dry hopping is to just um, move the beer into a keg that already has uh, hops in it, um, especially if you can do a closed transfer. Um, I worked with a company when I was uh, home brewing um, to try to come up with a solution to dry hop loose in kegs. Um, the reason being, and I think this was a question that was asked um, to both of us online, is you know dry hopping loose versus um, dry hopping um, in in a tight bag or a um, you know, there's like stainless steel canisters that you can you can buy that you can drop hops in. Mm -hmm. um, if you have them in a bag, um, there's some research that shows you can get as um, as much as 50% less extraction of some of the um, volatile oils if they're um, tight in a, a space like that versus just loose um, in the beer. Um, so that's kind of the reason I was trying to find a way to both, you know, dry hop loose as well um, as try to have hardly any oxygen pickup. So 
Um, I worked with this company called Utah Biodiesel that created a uh, filter for your dip tube. Um, so it's a 300 micron filter that goes around your dip tube and it goes into, I believe it's a six or six and a half inch silicone drilled stopper. So the dip tube goes through that stopper and then um, that stopper goes into the filter and then that goes around, um, makes a tight seal around your dip tube. So you can just toss the hops in to your keg loose um, and then you can close that keg up and purge it um, a number of times, like go up to 15 PSI, uh, PSI about, um, I don't know, three or four times each time um, removing most of the oxygen that's in there and then, you know, rack in. Um, so that's a good way to both purge, purge the hops themselves, um, as well as the container it's going in. And then a closed transfer in is a, is another, um, plus to try to, um, remove oxygen intake. So, um, I guess that's kind of a long answer to, to, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, to a couple you, ways. Yeah. You, you ticked a couple of items off the, the list there. Uh, Andy, yeah. Andy from uh, Facebook says caged, bagged, or loose. Does caging or bagging have an impact on the extraction of oils slash aroma. And Alexander says, sack or no sack? If so, do we weigh down the sack? Do we squeeze the sack? Well, that's a personal <laughs> that, issue, I think. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't squeeze the sack because then, then you'd have to do that above the beer, and that just sounds like a really good way to um, have oxygen intake and mm. you know, another way to, you know, you know, if you're using your hands or, or what, it just doesn't seem like a, a good idea, as well as removing the bag from from the hops to even squeeze it means you got to open it, the fermenter up again and, um, you know, splash, splash it a little bit by, by squeezing it. So I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't do that. But it, when you think about it, I mean, when, when you put the, the hops in the beer, uh, those pellets, if you're using pellets, they swell up and mm -hmm. then you've got this big ball of, of hops. And if they're in a bag or if they're in one of those mesh cylinders, it seems like to me that the that the beer doesn't get exposure to anything but the outside surface of that blob of hops. Now that's that's exactly right. I I, I remember a while back I wrote a wrote something on this and I kind of um, used the analogy of like if you've ever tried to wash like a giant bedspread and and put it in the dryer and the outside gets dry and the inside's still real wet. I mean it's the same same kind of thing but kind of flipped here. Um, the the for example, we've used um, we've done a lot of dry hopping with like sour beers at the brewery, and we'll sometimes you know fill one of those little um, 300 micron canisters. We'll you know, unscrew the cap and fill it half full of pellets. Um, dry hop for you know a couple days, and when I clean out that keg and I pull out that canister and I'm dumping out the hops, the the first of all it's like full. You know I, I filled it half full, but after it gets wet. And those pellets um, expand; it, it fills up that that canister, and and when you're dumping it out, there's whole pellets still in there that smell great. Um, they're mm. pretty much intact, um, and that's you know, you you never want to when throughout the brewing process, especially with hoppy beers, if you smell something really great, usually it's not the best sign. You want that to be in the beer. So, um, so dry hopping loose is always. Um, in my experience, it, it works better, and then there's you know there's also some um, studies that that show that um, sensory and as well as just measured oils are are increased. If you are uh, dry hopping loose, uh, and say you're dry hopping in the serving vessel, you're not getting those back out, right? I mean, is that is that good or is that bad? Um. It kind of, I mean, it kind of depends on what what you're after. I mean, I, I definitely, um, when I was doing a lot more homebrewing, I would I would leave hops um, in contact with the beer in the serving vessel for you know the duration. Um, I was also dry hopping at a little lower rates um, than I was today, which I think um, is helpful if you're going to be doing that. Um, there's just you're going to get. If you're dry, I mean, I guess we can get into some of the, there are some questions on like, you know, how the temperature to dry hop and all that. But you can, if you're dry hopping at serving temperature, you're still going to get extraction. But the longer that those hops sit, um, the more you can pick up some of the compounds from the hops that you um, may not necessarily want um, in the beer. Yeah, I, I dry hopped uh, with cryo hops and I haven't used cryo hops a lot. So I, I put them in the bag that I usually use for pellet hops. 
And then, you know, I, I followed your advice and, you know, uh, just dry hopped for a couple of days and I pulled the bag out and they were gone. <laughs> 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 you know, the hops were, they went right through that mesh, those cryo hops. Uh, so I went ahead and kegged the beer and the bitterness was um, kind of sharp for the first couple, three days. And then, but now it's mellowed out, uh, you know, the, the Amarillo. Uh, and now they it's kind of a, a, a kind of a stone fruit kind of um uh you know tropical fruit character whereas in the beginning it was uh you know kind of sharp a sharper bitterness along with that and, and I, don't, I don't know if that was just hop residue that settled to the bottom of the keg and I just you know drank it mm-hmm. <laughs> in the beginning or uh or what so um you know yeah. if you do if you don't have it in a bag you you have less control over over contact time i guess yeah, I mean, you could always transfer, you know, into a, another serving vessel if you want to do something like that, just to get it off the hops. Um, I don't know. In your case, was it a really fine mesh bag, or is it one of those mesh bags that you would use for like um, grain? Well, it wasn't as fine as I thought. I, <laughs> <laughs> like I say, it's usually, you know, that just that uh, mesh was is usually enough to, you know, to to hold the pellet hops in, but then mm-hmm. the cryo hops just went right through. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, the cryo hops do have less of the, you know, the whole point is to have less of the vegetal material. Um, and in my experience, and even talking to some other um, brewers, the cryo hops will stay in suspension a little better and a little longer um, than the traditional pellets like the T90s. And it's, um, and I, you know, I speculate that that's probably to do with, you know, um, they're finer, almost a little more powderier. So they'll mm-hmm. stay in, in solution a little better, which is a good thing for extraction. Um, and that the more vegetal um, uh, properties of the hop probably, you know, in summarizing a little too much, but probably just it's heavier, so it, it sinks out a little quicker. Um, so that could be part of it. And then, you know, dry hop beer in general just takes, you know, a lot longer. And I think a lot of people realize to um, settle out and get that hop burn out of there to, to really have a more uh, drinkable beer. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, going from one serving vessel to another. Uh, you know, again, you have to worry or be concerned about purging with CO2 and, and avoiding oxygen contact there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we um, if we're filling, like we do a lot of what we call like variants, which is essentially that, like you're taking 15 gallons, you know, a half barrel keg um, of already done beer and jumping it into another keg that has, you know, vanilla beans, coconut, or even more dry hops. Um, and we'll dry, we'll take that receiving keg and purge it, you know, three or four times, um, and then try to almost match the PSI of the serving keg. So whatever keg is coming in, they're almost exactly the same so that the beer doesn't just rush in. Um, and then you just slowly release pressure as you're, as you're jumping back into that keg. But, um, it, it is a good way to, to get, you know, cleaner servable beer, um, and then get it off you know, hops in this case. Um, and we're talking about, you know, contact uh, with, you know, beer and the hops, the dry hops. Uh, in addition to, you know, considering uh, adding the hops loose, you say that agitation uh, is another way that you can increase the contact to, uh, or contact between the beer and the hops. Yeah, agi- agitation can um, both speed up the extraction as well as um, increase the extraction um, for for home brewers it's it's I mean it, it can be as simple as just picking up your carboy and just kind of um, giving it a gentle swirl because um, really if those if those dry hops are sitting at the bottom of your um, vessel they're not they're not really doing anything for you they're not extracting into the beer so you kind of want to encourage them. Um, to get back into solution to um, start extracting their oils um, at, at the you know at, at the brewery we'll we'll pump um, we'll do like short blasts of co2 um, through the cone um, once a day for a couple days um, just to try to get those to um, blurt back into suspension which you could actually do as a home brewer too I know a lot of people will um, ferment in a keg um, and you could um, shoot some CO2 through your um, dip tube um, just to kind of, you know, blast all the hops that might have settled back into um, suspension. 
Um, but the the research is is pretty interesting in this. Um, there's you know recirculating is one way a lot of uh, professional brewers will do this. So essentially, um, immediately after dry hopping, you run the beer out of your tank um, through a, a pump, and then you go right back into your tank. So you're just kind of uh, moving the beer in a closed environment right right back into the tank. Um, and some of the research has found that um, you can get um, almost, I think it's uh, 50% higher extraction or higher than that. Um, it actually, it's closer to 60 from, if I'm remembering the paper right, that was, you know, just for two hours after adding the dry hops, um, there was a almost 60% increase in, in extraction um, just by recirculating for two hours. Um, and one, one paper even found that recirculating um, for six hours had the same hop intensity scores in a sensory panel compared to um, a beer that was dry hop for four days. Wow. Um, but this also has come at the expense of more greener, more astringent um, characteristics, um, which um, I sort of speculate that if you're recirculating too much, um, you might almost be in a way over extracting the hops, getting more of those greener compounds, um, especially polyphenols that can add to astringency. Um, so this actually is not something we've done much experimentation with, but I'm um, curious to start doing even like 15, 20 minute recirculation after adding dry hops um, and maybe just with the first charge just to see if what kind of uh, impact it might have. Yeah, there, in a lot of these areas, it seems like there's a Goldilocks effect of, uh, you know, there's too little and then there's too much and then there's, there's a sweet spot right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like timing, for example, uh, we've got lots of questions uh, uh, on timing. Uh, Frank says, best dry hop schedule for a NIPA. Uh, I do a double dry hop with one-third of the total amount during active fermentation and two-thirds from day five until day ten. Is this the right way? Uh, Tim says, is it best to remove the dry hops after a certain length of time? Uh, John says, any issues with adding hops to the fermenter at yeast pitching time? And uh, Christopher says, does uh, double dry hopping really help? And uh, also, uh, uh, Graciandi, maybe, uh, says, is it really worth worth it to double or triple dry hop? So those are all about timing. And so so when when should we put those dry hops in? And, and what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um. I mean, I think it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, I know we will sometimes, you know, one of those questions was, is um, can you uh, essentially dry hop the same time you're pitching yeast? So that would be like the same day um, you're knocking out, you're, you're adding dry hops. Um, we, we do this for some of our beers at, at Sapwood, um, but only if it's going to be a beer that we're not going to harvest that yeast um, because those um, the hops will eventually settle out. Um, it, with the yeast trub that you, or with the yeast and the trub that you would um, harvest for um, future batches, and you, you don't want that. Um, but you're also going to lose a whole lot of the um, hop character by adding them on day one. Um, you're especially the, the what's called like the hydrocarbons. So these are the more volatile, um, greener compounds um, that um, just the act of fermentation is going to be pushing those um, out of the out of the beer, but you could still um, be left behind with some of the more polar, um, they're called monoterpene alcohols that um, um, generally lead to a lot of the fruity flavors that you get in beer. So um, early early dry hop additions can, in my opinion, add a little bit of just, you sneak in maybe a little bit of um, hop saturated flavor, um, but you're not going to get a lot of that green sharp um, fresh dry hopped character. Hmm. One advantage of putting uh, the dry hops in while the yeast is still active, as we said before, is that, you know, they, the yeast can scrub some of that oxygen. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, I think one of those questions was, I think somebody said they dry hop, um, they uh, I think in two or three rounds. And one of them was, it sounded like when there's still some active fermentation. Um, I still think we, we don't always do that um, at the brewery, but you know it's two two different beasts when you're um, brewing at home and brewing at the brewery. There's just different um, variables to consider. But if I were um, brewing at home still, I, I think I would still be adding a dry hop charge during the tail end of fermentation. Um, you could just, for one, you 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 get some hops in, 
because you're, you're probably not going to be harvesting that yeast. You can always just build up a starter beforehand um, or overbuild your starter beforehand and then steal some of the, the yeast for future batches. So you can dry hop um, during active fermentation and not worry about harvesting that yeast. Um, by adding it during active fermentation, you're um, reducing some of the chance of um, oxygen pickup. Um, and then you might also be scrubbing some of the greener um, harsher compounds, polyphenols can can attach to some of the yeast. Uh, you might be pushing out some of the myrcene, which is a very green resinous um, compound that's usually um, one of the majority um, compounds in the of hop oils. Um, and then you might still you might be pushing out. You probably are pushing out some more of the fruitier compounds as well. But um, you can always do one or two more dry hop charges um, later. Um, and there's there's some science around why you'd want to do that too. Um, you can get increased um, extraction of hop compounds um, if you're breaking up into smaller hop charges. Um, so rather than putting in, you know, one dry hop charge of, uh, let's say 10 ounces or something in five gallons, you're going to get a lot less extraction than if you're going to be do- breaking that into um, three smaller um, dry hop charges. But again, if you're going to be dry hopping three times in the homebrew level, you need to make sure that your um, the procedures you use for not getting oxygen in are, are really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, there, uh, in the book, you, you talk about, uh, the disadvantages, uh, that you get when you put too much dry hops in there. So what's the, how do you figure out how much uh, hops to put in there. And I guess, I guess we know that if you don't put enough, you don't get it, you know, you don't get enough of a hop character, but what are the disadvantages of putting too much? I had too, too much in my opinion. And, and I've, um, I, I've said this before, but I, I just, uh, my complaint about a lot of hazy IPAs is they're, they're overly astringent, overly green. Um, and this is in my opinion, just overly dry hopped. Um, if you're dry hopping at rates that are too high, I think you lose some of the varietal specific flavors you get from the hop. Um, for example, if you dry hop citra, you know, six ounces and and five gallons versus let's say, you know, something crazy like 20, um, you're, you're just going to get like a generic green hop flavor or end aroma in that heavily hopped one rather than that fresh kind of, um, you know, citrus thing you love about citra. Um, and for whatever reason, I still don't know for sure. I think this is especially true if there's not enough hot side hops being used, um, especially just late in the whirlpool. If you're doing almost all late, um, dry hopping and hardly anything on the, the hot side, it just seems like that, um, astringent ca- character takes over and there's no hop saturated flavor to sort of back it up and carry it through. Um, but you know, in terms of how much is the perfect amount, I mean, it's, it's so tough to say there's. Um, one paper that, uh, you know, a lot of people look at, it's a great one. And it, and it was at, um, I think they looked at cascade hops, um, and they found that, um, if they did about seals, like four to f- doing the math to get to a homebrew um, batch of like four to five ounces, um, in a five gallon batch, that's when cascade had highest scores for, um, citrus flavors, um, sensory panel liked it more. Um, and if they started going much higher than that, um, they started to get more herbal and tea characteristics. Hmm. Um, and so that's, that's just with cascade. Um, and that's also, you know, a relatively low alpha acid hop. Um, but that's, I say that there's you know, you know, research that, that shows that higher alpha acid hops might actually, um, not extract as well, um, in beer just because those elf acids um, aren't being isomerized and almost repel liquid a little bit. Um, but that's, that's something I'd love to see more, more research in. And there's a, there's a whole chapter on uh, dry hopping and bitterness. Um, you said that, uh, that dry hops can actually uh, lower the amount of isomerized alpha acid. Uh, in other words, the bitterness in, in the beer uh, but then the dry hops, depending on their age and oxidation of the hops themselves, uh, that can also have uh, an impact on the perceived uh, bitterness of the beer too. Yeah, it's kind of a it's uh, dry hopping. You, you almost get 
astringency and, and bitterness in two ways. It's uh, just like you said, the leaf material and hops themselves um, can actually pull out isomerized alpha acids from the hot side. Um, it's, you know, just think of it as like they're just being consumed by the, the hops themselves and then being, being left behind. Um, but it's being replaced by humulones, which are a, a bittering acid, um, just like alpha acids. Um, but they aren't, as, you know, sensory-wise, they're not as bitter. I believe that it's about 66% um, as bitter as one isomerized alpha acid. Um, and there's been some research by John Paul May from Hopsteiner um, that um, these are actually this bitterness is sensory wise a little easier on the palate, a little smoother. Um, but if you're dry hopping heavily, in my, in my opinion, too many of these humulones along with, you know, the increased amount of polyphenols you'll get from heavy dry hopping, um, can actually, um, come across as like, it's, it's a astringent character that you, it's sort of bitter, but it's just, it just lingers and, um, lingering astringency and bitterness can definitely get in the way of, some of that hop saturated flavor that uh, I think most brewers are after. Um, some of the, like you mentioned cryo hops earlier, um, a lot of the vegetal materials removed from those. Um, so in theory they should have, uh, you know, less of an impact on pulling out some of those hot side, um, isomerized alpha acids, um, as well as hopefully, um, not, contributing as many polyphenols, um, but that's still something I'd, I'd like to see um, researched a little more. And you said that there, there was a study that, that uh, indicated that hop aroma uh, actually uh, increases the perceived bitterness of beers as well. Yeah, that's kind of kind of interesting. I'm, I'm not really sure what to do with it <laughs> other than, you know, it's just, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you... Uh, if you smell a grapefruit and then someone gives you an orange, I, I, you'd probably think it's more bitter. I, I've never actually done that, but um, the, the smell of hops are, are, are kind of bitter, and so that that makes sense. So um, it's it's tricky. I mean, there's there's almost there's so much information, um, and sometimes it, the studies don't always agree with each other. But um, it's it's fun to use it to to try to just just do experiments a little and and see what see what you get. You talk a lot about uh, dry hopping and pH. Um, how does dry hopping affect the pH of beer and, and should it matter all that much? Um, yeah, this is actually one I'm, I'm kind of interested in now and I, I might do some little trials with just finished beer, but um, heavily dry hopped beers, um, you know, particularly hazy IPAs, um, usually have a higher um, pH than, than other beers. And this is because, and again, this is a, uh, Hopsteiner, uh, May study that, that found that, um, dry hopping raises the pH of beer. Um, it's about, um, 0 0.14 units per pound of dry hops. So, uh, you know, five ounces and five gallons might raise the pH, you know, 0 0.28, um, units or so. Um, that's of course, um, an estimate because it really depends on where your, your starting pH is when you add, add the dry hops to, to see how much it would, it would, uh, raise. Um, but it's important because there's, um, research that shows that the higher the beer's pH, the higher the, um, sensory bitterness can be. Hmm. Um, and so if you're, you know, ex dry hopping extremely heavily and then you, you know, you're adding, just raising the pH can, um, increase the bitterness perception as well as, you know, you're adding more humulones, which is an increase the bitterness um, you're also adding um, more polyphenols, which can increase their astringency, which sometimes, in my opinion, is um, similar to a bitterness type of um, flavor. But so it's it's interesting to look at pH to see how can we alter it a little bit to to get a more uh, drinkable beer. Um, at, at I know right now all we really do. Um, at the brewery is we usually, if we're going to do an IPA or double IPA, we'll start, um, with trying to just hit a pretty low mash pH, like five, one or so. Um, and that's just in hopes that, you know, maybe we're setting the stage for a slightly lower final beer pH so that the heavily, heavy dry hops won't, um, increase it too much. Mm. Um, 
But there's, you know, going back to some of the work that, and in fact, I actually sent an email to Dr. John Paul Mave to get some insight into this. Um, and he, they've done some research um, where New England IPAs um, actually had slightly lower pHs on average than West Coast style IPAs, which is surprising to me. Hmm. Um, and they think it, it probably has something to do with um, the vegetal material and the hops maybe pulling out um, some of the uh, – um, the vegetative matter itself is actually raising the pH is what they're, they're estimating. Um, so that could mean that like cryo and T45 hops might not, um, impact the pH as much, huh. which is interesting. Um, and also there's just, um, you know, the higher the pH, um, from heavily dry hops, um, has also shown to, um, reduce the head retention a little on beer. Um, and this is, um, you know, so that's some, some hazy IPAs can have pretty poor head retention. And um, that could be one reason why, as well as just um, the longer beer is in contact with um, dry hops, um, the, the worse head retention has been shown. Hmm. So I think it's, you know, not a negative impact after about two days, but then from day three to eight, it just keeps declining. Um, so it's another another reason to maybe consider getting dry hops off beer um, relatively quickly. But um, back to the, the pH, um, they, they, test, they actually added sulfuric acid to finished beers. So um, they had beer that was um, finished at a pH of 4.9, which is pretty high. I don't think you'll get quite that high with a lot of these heavily um, dry hop beers, but you might get pretty close to that. Um, and they dropped the pH to 4.5 with sulfuric acid. Uh, and then they had a sensory panel look at it. Um, and they found that the lower pH beers didn't, they didn't taste as good. Um, so they, you know, they don't know if it was just because of the type of acid they used, you know, maybe if they used lactic acid, it might've been a, a different result, but, um, this is a pretty easy thing to experiment with. Um, cause you can just use finished beer and then dose in a little, um, you know, for example, lactic acid and, and you know, do a blind taste test and, and see which one you like. And if you like the lower pH, um, then you maybe post fermentation, dry hopping, um, doctoring of the pH levels is, is worth exploring. Hmm. We, we touched on it, but have we talked a lot about uh, temperature? We talked about time, we talked about amounts, but we haven't talked a bunch about uh, dry hopping temperature, have we? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should. Yeah. <laughs> um. I, I, I'm a fan of at least experimenting with um, slightly lower temperatures when it comes to dry hopping. Um, almost all the dry hopping we do at the brewery starts at around um, uh, 58 degrees. Um, and this, this, that's, that's kind of the temperature that's considered like the, the soft crash. Um, that's enough to, to, to get the yeast to start settling out. Um, I like to get the yeast out of the beer before um, dry hopping on the um, – on bigger volumes, um, professional volume levels. Um, and that 58 degrees helps do that. But, um, you, there's, you know, the research has shown that even at cool, cooler temperatures, you're still getting, um, extraction and you're still getting pretty quick extraction, um, with hops. Um, and there's other, uh, benefits to, to cooler, cooler dry hopping. Um, especially if there's still even a little bit of active, active fermentation, um, warmer, Temperatures can actually remove some more of the um, um, hop compounds. If the beer is warmer and there's a little more fermentation, there's um, some research. This mostly revolves around hop thiols, but um, the cooler the fermentation temperature, the more um, hop thiols from dry hops was retained, um, which is why I, I did an article not too long ago about um, a, a good friend, uh, Spencer Love, did a, actually brewed the beer for me based off some of the um, research um, and this was like a, a lager that we fermented cooler, but, um, and also had it like wine yeast. This is kind of a more of a bio transformation, um, experiment, but, um, the research showed that, you know, the cooler the beer, um, ferments, um, the more these hop files, which are, are pretty potent, um, can remain in the beer. Um, so keeping the beer cold with hop contact is, um, 
in that regard, um, one reason to do it, but although that's active fermentation and we're talking more um, post-fermentation. Um, so it, it, other factors, um, hop creep, for example, um, is another um, area where if you're um, dry hopping cooler um, and you're dry hopping for shorter durations, you have less of a less of chance of that um, happening, which for us on the commercial scale is very important. You don't want um, diacetyl or something like that coming up with um, after dry hopping. Andrew on Facebook uh, asked, uh, he had the shortest question with maybe the longest answer because you have a chapter in the <laughs> in the book. He, Andrew just says, explain hop creep. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that could be another show. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. but uh, give us the elevator pitch for, uh, for hop creep. Sure. Uh, hop creep, it, it's essentially – so there's enzymes um, – in hops, you know, think of them similar to when you're when you're mashing the the enzymes that help um, free up fermentable sugars. Um, there's a few in hops themselves that when you're dry hopping, and I think this is especially true when you have high levels of dextrins, which um, the hazy IPAs, New England IPAs generally do. Dextrins are you know un, you know unfermentable um, sugars essentially that um, will leave the beer sweeter. Um, which New England IPAs are generally pretty sweet. Um, we're finishing usually around um, 1.020 or so in a lot of these beers. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of dextrins there. Um, and when you're dry hopping, um, these enzymes can start to uh, work on those and free them up, and this um, makes them fermentable um, by yeast. Um, and so if you've already removed the yeast from the beer, if you've dropped the cone, um, for example, the little bit that's still in there can start working on these newly freed sugars, and then you could start having unhealthy uh, re-fermentation, which could lead to um, off flavors like diacetyl. Mm. Um, if you've packaged the beer, um, you might see a rise in um, your CO2 levels, which which can be an issue. Um, but yeah, like you said, in, in the book, there's a whole whole chapter on it, um, and I you know asked around and to other breweries to get, you know, advice on what they do and then what some of the research has, has said on the, on the topic. Um, and essentially, um, the warmer the beer is dry hopped, um, the more active these en enzymes will be. And the longer the hops are in contact, the more that they, they can work. So shorter duration at cooler temperatures is generally better. Hmm. So essentially, hop creep. Uh, you put the hops in; the enzymes break down the sugars or the the starches into sugars more. Any yeast that's still around says, "Oh, we get to eat again," and then you start uh, eating again, and so you you gain a little more alcohol, you uh, lose a little gravity, and and you might gain some unhealthy uh, side flavors or, or or off flavors from from that sort of secondary, maybe sickly fermentation. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think homebrewers don't have to worry as much because generally you're not dropping out all the yeast. And so you probably have a fairly healthy refermentation, but you just have to be patient enough to to let it go. Um, and, and I do wonder, um, going back to you know, earlier when there's the question on like day one dry hopping, um, if some of those enzymes are working the whole time and are actually leading towards a, a lower finishing gravity, as if you didn't um, dry hop on day one, um, that would be kind of something fun to test at some point. Well, Scott, we've we've covered a lot of ground, and I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be scared. <laughs> well, it it helps him talking to somebody who knows, you know, knows what he's talking about. And that's a, that's what often happens on this show. You know, I I can hide my ignorance by just asking, you know, questions. And so <laughs> Well, you know, I I I have to you know I, I thanked everyone in, in the in the acknowledgments in the book but you know I most of the people that that wrote these papers and you know did these studies are much much smarter than I and then I emailed them and bugged them quite a bit to make sure I was understanding what they were doing correctly so I, I know what it feels like to be you know intimidated by uh, the results of some of this work <laughs> Well, I appreciate your, your taking the time again. Again, the book is The New IPA, A Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. 
and the brewery uh, that you run with our our friend uh, Mike Tonsmeyer, the mad fermentationist, is Sapwood Cellars. And where y'all at? We are in Columbia, Maryland, so kind of right in between Baltimore and D.C. There you go. One day I hope to make a pilgrimage there to to uh, taste taste your wares fresh off the tap. Please do. We'd love <laughs> to have you. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This is this is always fun. Well, thanks again to Scott. Scott's blog is Scott. Janish.com, S-C-O-T-T-J-A-N-I-S-H.com. And his book is The New IPA, A Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. Just chocked full of good information. Uh, Always fun to talk to Scott as well. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com and just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>